The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. She was growing into a teenager and was living then in the obscure village of Nazareth in Galilee. She gathered the grain during the day and tended the lamp laid into the watches of the night. Her father knew the dedication of her work, her mother the kindness of her heart, her friends the curve of her smile. She stood on the threshold of womanhood. Among all the girls in the village, she had been noticed, chosen, betrothed, a child bride before whom lay only possibility. Her father could walk with pride in the city gates. Her mother could rest in the comfort of her daughter's future security. But then he came, unexpected, unannounced, spoke openly and without shame of pregnancy, virginity, and a son. Things men never discussed, and women only whispered about behind closed doors. She questioned him about the particulars, but not about the promise. She knew the prophecies, and the angel's words rang true. She would be scorned and rejected, labeled as an adulteress in whispers and glances. There would be no more carefree walks to the market, no more happy trips to the well. Four hundred years her people had waited for hope, but God had been silent. Now he had spoken. The wait was about to end. Forty weeks. And then, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for joining me. Just even that little, little whisper of a wind that went past there, just reminded of, of uh, the, the presence of the Spirit. And coming, coming down upon us, and, and, and that, that the Spirit lives within each of us. And so it is, as both Janet and Brett attested to, it's, it's in little and big things. It's in, uh, it's in when, we, when we dig into the Word of Scripture, and when we um, are going about our daily lives, God shows up. So thank you again. <coughs> Today we're going to focus on chapter 1 of the book of Luke. And I'm sure it's a familiar story to many of you, if not all of you. We're going to pick it up in verse chapter 26. Uh, as per the norm, the scripture will be up here on the screen if you prefer to follow along. Or you can open up your Bible as well. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a, pled, to, be, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. 
I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Today, as we dig into this text, we're going to answer three questions. First, what exactly did Mary know? Secondly, why is Mary told that she is highly favored? And then finally, out of this, kind of as a summary, what is the only appropriate response when God chooses to use us? My sermon in a sentence this week is this. Note the pun here, for those of you that know I like puns. The merry way for us to live life is to find favor in the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing we read here, that we acknowledge here, the first point is that the favor of God in Mary's life is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Now one of the great things about Scripture is the number of promises that we see fulfilled. I've already referenced that earlier this morning about the fact that in Advent, we can be reminded of so many prophecies that were fulfilled through the birth of Christ. But we know that over 350 prophecies have been fulfilled or will be fulfilled as a result of the the birth and death and life of Jesus. The birth was no exception. One that we all are very aware of was that he was to be born of a virgin who turned out to be Mary. And we read that there in in verse 26 here again. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. In there, I spotted at least four prophecies fulfilled. It's in that sentence. And that one statement of scripture that was fulfilled through Christ. Now I want you to take a moment and imagine that in Wilmer, that they just recently discovered ancient scrolls. And these scrolls, which were written 500, 1,000, maybe even 1,500 years ago, some of them were written before the discovery of America. And all of them were written before the Revolution. Now in these scrolls, what you find is that someone in our generation will be born in direct lineage of George Washington. This person would be described, or would be descended from a long line of our founding fathers, all of whom were known to be from Virginia. The scrolls further reveal that the person would be born in Meeker County, Minnesota, in the town of Grove City. Miraculously, this child's mother would be a virgin. And at the time of this child's birth, dignitaries from every country all over the world would mysteriously know about this. And they would come here to Grove City to worship and present gifts, believing that he was a special envoy from God. In addition, in our imaginary prophecy here, it's resulted that we see that he was born that local tyrants would make an attempt to murder him. In addition, it would result in the death of many innocent boys whose mothers and fathers would weep over their loss. And so to protect this child, the father would take them and leave, heading to another area which God had told him was safe, and then later would return. Now imagine that all of this came true in our lifetime. 
fulfilling the predictions of these age-old, century-old, centuries-old scrolls. We probably think that's pretty unlikely. The odds of all of those things happening. We'd be skeptical, perhaps. We live in an age of skepticism. And yet, this is a fair parallel to the Old Testament prophecies. I won't even, I didn't underline them here, I won't even try to go through there, maybe I'll do this later, and count how many imaginary prophecies that correlate to real prophecies that Jesus' birth fulfilled. It's too many to be mere coincidence. And as was said in the video, considering how sacred the Jewish text was to them, Mary knew the prophecies. But despite this overwhelming evidence, very few recognized who he truly was. And take heed in this for us in this day, that we are told that many will be asleep, many will scoff, many will doubt, many will be deceived, and many will be enticed from the truth of God's word, just as they were then, by doctrines of demons and false teachers. So as we sit here and wait for Christ's second coming, do not grow cold or treat casually the signs of our times. Because our redemption draws nigh. The favor of God in Mary's life, secondly, reveals that God had an important purpose. Scripture reveals to us that, as an example, Noah was favored by God. So were Abraham and David, among others. Whenever an individual was favored by God, an important part of work was set to play out. In verse 28, we read, The angel, Gabriel, went to see her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. As I mentioned earlier, because of this high value placed on the scriptures, Mary understood very well what was going to happen to some extent from being called favored. But she was puzzled. What was this highly favored, this word? The Greek word here is keratu. It can be translated highly favored or full of grace. We read in verse 29 that Mary was troubled by this. Unsure of the implications of Gabriel's words. What was this about? Now, as good practice, when we're studying a studying the Bible, when we come to passages with which um, people come to differing conclusions, it's important to pause and consider a couple of things. Because it is in this passage with which um, some have been led astray about the role of who Mary is. And so we're going to pause here, we're going to come back to this as I've done before, and let's revisit with my first uh, important Bible strategy, studying strategy, and that is to look at the verses immediately around it. What significance does the label highly favored given to Mary mean? And for what reason was it given? Is this verse telling us something special about Mary? After all, words do matter, and we would be wise to discern what Luke is saying here. Given the fact that we've had these issues, let's dig into our first practice of considering the text around it. And so in this case, in this instance, we find our first clue in verse 30. But before I reveal the clue, I'm going to give you an example. My wife, I wish my wife was sitting in here right now because I was giddy about using this example today, but um, she would roll her eyes at me. But, uh, so... Um, Suppose that I was an appraiser of goods. 
and you had a ring that you brought to me to appraise. Now you know that when you bring a possession to an appraiser, you can rightfully expect to be given an estimate of the response, or of the value of that item. Did he give away? Oh, he gave it away already. That's all right. Okay, so, <laughs> pretend you didn't see that. Um, but before, um, so perhaps you bring it in, and I, and I came back to you with this. I said, your ring is worth Floxy Knox and the Hill of Pillification. <laughs> Pretending that you didn't see that, uh, my guess is that you would probably feel a little bit like Mary did. Unsure, what does this mean? This is something different, new. I just I don't know what to, how to handle that. And so if it were not for my ninth grade English teacher, I'd be in the same boat. So what could remove that uncertainty? If there is a word, you probably all, in the course of your lifetime, you certainly have run into situations where it's like, I don't know what that word means. So you you need some kind of a, a translation, if you will. And so the most helpful thing I could do in this case would be to use a word, we would call it a synonym, a word that reveals what I am saying, but that's in most people's vocabulary. Be honest with me. Now, how many of you had heard of the word floxynoxynhilophilification before today? You're not missing out on a whole lot, so it's pretty worthless, if you'll see. So I dare say, if I came to you, I would be better off saying, I estimate your ring is essentially worthless. No doubt that rings more clearly to you. Now, back to verse 30. The reason I brought this up, more than an English lesson, was that after seeing Mary's uncertainty, Gabriel clarifies to tell Mary that she is favored using a different Greek word that is more closely aligned with the Hebrew word that's used for Noah, Abraham, and for David, along with others. Gabriel still means that she's highly favored, but he needs to put it in terms she can understand. Now, don't miss out the reason Mary is highly favored in verses 31 through 34. This is vital. It is because she will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, for his kingdom will never end. And so what we see here is that Mary is highly favored, not because of anything about her, but because God's grace is given to her in such a magnitude because she's given the blessing of bearing the Messiah. Now, if that's not enough, I'm probably speaking to the choir anyway on this issue, but let's turn to a second strategy. Because I think part of my responsibility up here as well is, for, uh, is to, to, to help each other navigate through how do we deal with Passages. How do, what is a, 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 a positive method uh, with which to take when studying Scripture? So that we don't shy away from things that are maybe of challenge. We don't just take things out of mere tradition, but that as we read through things, we do justice to the, to the Scripture. And so the second strategy here is now let's consider where this word, karatu, is used throughout Scripture. Now, being a Greek word, we can't look back at the Old Testament. We focus on the New Testament. It's used one other time. And so we have to at least put some sense of weight on what does the other reference speak to. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. I'm going to actually read verses 6 and 7. But here is what it says. To the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now in this case, the word karatu is translated slightly differently. It is translated as grace freely bestowed. Now to whom is this grace bestowed? 
And through whom is it given? Now, if you look up there in that text, it's very clear that we can read that the grace bestowed is to us, it's to believers, through the Beloved. Well, who's the Beloved? It's Jesus. He's the only one who redeemed us by his blood. And so we must carefully dig through scriptures to mine for truth. You may be sitting here saying, I answered that question years ago. Decades ago, I knew this. But how do you respond to someone who says, I disagree? This is what I think the text says. How do we use all of Scripture as profit, beneficial for teaching one another? These are but two methods with which we interpret other texts. And while this is the word of God, it is still a text. It is still a text with which we must weigh carefully context as well as the word usage throughout Scripture. Many have been led to a false sense of significance of who Mary is. But there are many other heresies that we see played out in our churches even to this day that are born out of tradition. So let's set the record straight now. Why is Mary told she is highly favored? She's favored solely because God graciously blessed her to bear the Messiah. In other words, Mary was God's chosen vessel, but Jesus is the one who is great. He is the only one who is called the Son of the Most High. And then lastly which is usually the part that we're most uh, interested in. That's what, what's the application here? What's the answer to this question? What's our only response? And so thirdly, we read, the favor of God in Mary's life is rightly responded to with humility. Now, do some reflection in your own life for just a second. When you've had some important responsibility or opportunity given to you, how have you responded? Let me give you a couple of examples that I thought of. Maybe it's, you happen to be in an industry or a business where the boss, for whatever reason, maybe it was justified in your mind, maybe you don't know, but they favored you, and they gave you opportunities that all of your coworkers desperately wanted. Or maybe your parents gave you the responsibility to be the executor of your will, or of their will. And maybe there was infighting, either above the surface or below the surface, because other siblings wanted that responsibility. Many workplaces have seen a fall in worker relations because this chosen person has lorded it over them. I've been in places where I have seen those who have kind of a, the reputation of um, being the special one, or the, you know, the, boss, the boss is giving you the benefit of the doubt, and uh, people are usually living with them and head, look at me, look what I have been given. They, they use that power and authority, in a sense, to lord it over those who are not elected or not selected. I've also seen, sadly, many families end with divisions because the executor manipulates the use of the funds, or those who are not the executors um, cause those things to cause divisions in families. It's for this reason. I, you guys don't know my family, really. You've met my parents once. But we have, I have been blessed with a very close, tight-knit family and blessed with two sisters who, like myself, don't care about the possessions. Yeah, there's a thing here or there that we would say, yeah, this reminds us of our parents, when they should pass. But I, I truly believe, my parents know full well, there will not be this fighting between us. And yet I recall two years ago, out of great humility, my dad sitting me down and being from Minnesota, you know, being in Iowa at the time, being the one child removed, I was, of course, you know, often the last one to hear things. 
he hits down and he says, I want you to know that we selected some, you know, my brother-in-law to be the executor. And he wanted me to understand that. And he said, I want you to, to be, I want to make sure that you're okay with that. And I said, it's your choice. But know that um, I'm not in it for the stuff, nor are they. And yet he came, it was out of this humility that he still brought forth. Though I do truly believe he understands there will be no issues. It's that humility that is endearing. And it's what's endearing about Mary here as well. Notice her response after Gabriel gives her the most absolutely incredible, in some ways, responsibility. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She responded in the only right way when we are given God's favor, and that's with humility. Let's make this sink in just a little bit more. Have you ever felt, you don't have to speak out, but I have a feeling many of you would say you have. How many of you felt blessed by God at one point or another? And while I won't sit here and contradict myself by the sense, I think we need to share some of those things. I think those things can be important. We need to be careful also that we aren't using these blessings as well. Look at who God likes. Look what God's doing with me. No, it's out of humility. You know, it's a, a, I was reading through the book of Ezekiel this morning. And about he sees the presence of God and immediately he's thrust down, face down on the ground. And so, as we go into our times of testimony in the future, the whole point of this is to show how God uses us to remind others that his favor is available to all of us. It's not based on who we are or what we did. So when we give testimony, praise God today, two great examples. Where did the, where did the praise go? Who got the glory? I can tell you right now, I know for sure who got the glory from those testimonies. It was about God. That's what a testimony is to be about. It's, not, it's really not a testimony about ourselves. It's a testimony about God's faithfulness. Because God chooses perfectly. God chose Mary because he knew Mary's character better than she did. He knows our character better than we do as well. So, did Mary know what was coming? I believe if she was Minnesotan, she would say, you betcha. <laughs> like her, our roles are known, our role is to know the scripture. Now, guys, this is a little bit harder for you because you're not female, but Position yourself, in a sense, in Mary's spot. If you want to say, or Joseph, or any of the, the disciples, ask you this, I'm going to ask you this question. If you had the Old Testament, no New Testament, you were living in that day, based on your degree of study and so forth, could you confidently say, I know the prophecies, that I know what is to come? Now, she didn't know the particulars. She didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But she knew that that promise was going to take place. And so while God provides the blessings, we are to receive them humbly. Because we know that the kingdom of God is not only intended for us, but for the whole world. And so we close this morning with this. The merry way for us to live life is to find favor in the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't be found to be afraid to share the good news. Ed alluded to this in our prayer time. There are people, I mean, this is just a tough time for many people in general because of loss of loved ones, 
um, whatever it may be, the holidays, whether it be your first one without a loved one or maybe the 30th one without a loved one. They're difficult. Don't let opportunities pass you by to share God's grace through the redemption of Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we we come before you this morning just again so thankful for the sacrifice that you made. Not just the sacrifice at the cross, Lord, but just the sacrifice of, of coming down here to be born as an infant, as a baby. To be born in in a stable, in a lowly manner. Lord, we know that if a normal human had the opportunity to dictate their birth, they would certainly not be in such lowly means. And yet, you intentionally came because of your nature, that you use the weak to overcome the strong, Lord, and that we are reminded that when we are weak, it is in those times that you are made strong. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness with which Mary chose to live her life, the character that she had. But more importantly, we know and are, are incredibly grateful that you know us intricately, that you know every hair on our head. And so, Lord, as we go uh, and continue through this Advent season and that we are continually reminded of all that you are and all that you have come to do and the, the willingness you had to do something that... Uh, that was necessary to, to reconcile us to Christ. Lord, help give us the boldness to take this message forth. That you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that even though you sit up on high and that you are the judge of the world, Lord, and that you know all of both the good and the bad that are a part of our past, and of our future, Lord, we also know that you are a God of grace. Lord, help us to live in a manner of repentance and teach others to do likewise, Lord, that your love for them is so great that, they, that, that the reason that you are so long-suffering is because you desperately don't want to see anyone perish. Be with this body as we return back to our weekly lives, Lord. Help us not to be complacent. Help us to be aware of how you are at work. Help us to be part of that work, Lord. Help us to be used by you each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and we'll have our benediction before our last... Be a people of hope. Let hope live in your heart and, sh and share the hope of Christ with all you meet. Share hope by noticing someone else's humanity. Share hope by listening to someone else's story. Share hope by praying for the world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share hope. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share hope with those you meet. Grace and peace be with you. Amen.